The Building Better Business podcast is the best place to learn how to take your business to the next level. It's no longer enough to earn good profits. You need to develop a network of connections as well as use all types of marketing to your advantage that will put you over the edge. Hosted by me, Steve Eschbach, a financial executive with decades of experience in dealing with businesses and business people, we'll learn how this all comes together. Join me and my expert guests as we delve into the many facets of owning the business and how to become a good, caring business owner. Listen how making a difference in your community can attract all sorts of clientele, which in turn will build you a better business. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Building Better Businesses. I'm your host, Steve Eschbach. I own a uh, mergers and acquisitions company called Transworld Business Advisors. We are the largest and fastest growing business brokerage in the world, and I'm delighted to have Tristan Bond with me here today. Uh, He's got a unique approach to uh, what I would characterize building better businesses in. I would generally categorize it as the healthcare field, but we'll learn more about that in a moment. So first of all, Tristan, thank you so much. I understand you're joining us from down under, so you're a little bit further away from Chicago than I am today. Absolutely. Well, Steve, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And we're just having this joke before. I'm I'm living in the future for you. So um, I'll let you know everything that's going to happen for the rest of your evening. I appreciate that. I like looking forward. Before we begin, let's find out a little bit more about you. So uh, I know that you were a uh, physiotherapist and you turned into a business coach and business owner. Uh, So why don't you tell us a little bit about, A, who it is you are, what it is you do, and uh, how you help, uh, I would guess, other business owners become better. Fantastic. All right, great. So um, as you said, my background is uh, physical therapy. Um, I started, uh, well, I studied here in South Australia. I grew up in the country, 400 kilometers from, from Adelaide, the capital city. I moved here to study and I became a physiotherapist, and which I loved, still love. And uh, I started my first practice when I was uh, 23. And I loved that so much that I expanded them, uh, sold them, and I did that by developing this method of uh, growing and scaling healthcare businesses. And from there, that led into a coaching space where people would ask me for advice. Um, I was taken on as a consultant for another coaching company back then. And then my journey is that from there, I evolved into setting up my own brand where I could really um, further develop my strategies, roll them out on a larger scale and really focus on them. So that's what we do now is we coach healthcare practitioners to grow their companies, uh, predominantly uh, physiotherapists, chiropractors, podiatrists, and dentists. And we have a real mix in there as well. But anyone that's in the healthcare space that can employ a, a number of team members that are also revenue producers. And that's our thing. Good. Good to know. We'll learn more about that in a moment. But first, I want to rewind the videotape if I could. Let's talk a little bit about your childhood. So uh, tell me a little bit about you and your formative years, what you were thinking about when you were growing up, how your parents influenced where you are today, if they did at all. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think Probably in 1986, like everyone else, I was six. I wanted to become Maverick from Top Gun, so I wanted to become a, a pilot. And then my, my family uh, owned an my dad owned an accounting firm, which he bought from his father. So there's always been a very strong business influence in my background, where I've been I've just been around it and absorbing it, and I've been aware of the importance of um, growth and the the level of work that goes into things and systemization. So it was always in my background. Like I said, I grew up in the country, a town of 23,000 people in an iron ore community. And then um, I moved up to, the, to, up to Adelaide to go to a private school when I reached um, high school age to give me the best chance to oh, really further my education so I could have a really progressive career. My parents were really good like that. But um, it was in high school that I went to um, see this physical. Well, actually, before that, before all that, actually, dad, re- dad recounts his story to me. I went and saw a dentist, um, Akira Amafuji. Um, in Playford Avenue in Wyala, um, I had a toothache and um, I came out of there um, seven or eight years old and I showed dad the receipt and I was like, this guy just made $75 in 15 minutes. That's pretty cool. Um, I think I'll become a dentist. So um, I started looking into that like as a kid. I was like, maybe I'll be in healthcare. So I started having this real interest in healthcare. Um, but when I got to the high school age, I was 14 years old. I had this terrible hockey injury. Um, I injured my hip. I could barely walk for three months. Oh my. And the final straw was um, a, a family friend said, 
and I was getting acupuncture, which is a great modality, by the way, but I wasn't progressing. And a family friend said, why don't you see this physiotherapist we know? His name's Rick Neagle. He's really great. So I went and saw him and um, I was like, wow, physiotherapy is like this wonder cure. It's amazing. I was able to walk out of there and within five weeks, I was back to full health. And at that moment, I was like, I do love healthcare, but I don't want to do dentistry anymore. I want to do, I want to do physiotherapy because I've experienced it. So that's kind of how I got into that. And ironically, when I chose, um, when I'm, the school results came out and um, I had to choose between dentistry and physiotherapy and I went and spent some time with Rick, the guy that was my physio that I met when I was 14. And uh, we talked about that and uh, based on his life and what he was achieving, I was like, that's what I want to do. I just want to do it myself. So that's a bit about how I ended up at this point. Um, I had a very um, heavy sports background as well, which is probably why I was um, navigating more towards physiotherapy too, because I could see the, the benefits of getting treatment to get back on the sports track. So somewhere along that path, you went from your physiotherapy business, so to speak, or running your own practice or working at a practice to becoming a business owner. How did that transition take place? The first thing that happened was I was working at a practice in, in Semaphore, which is 50 minutes from home and um, a great practice and it really got along with my boss really well, still really good friends with him. Um, in fact, his clinic is now uh, 300 meters from where my office is and we're still in touch. But um, he offered me a partnership deal to join there when I was 22. He could see I was really interested in what I was doing. I was working hard. I was very passionate about it. And he said he wanted me to be part of the future there, which I also wanted. Um, so that's when I started considering, oh, well, maybe I can become a business owner. This is really good. Started looking into that a lot more. I started becoming more entrepreneurial. Around this time, I went into a Young Entrepreneur of the Year Challenge uh, with the Ernst & Young accounting firm. I created this idea around the current model that I'm using, which they really liked. So I presented that idea to James, and um, I think he's he may potentially right now feel, a, feel bad he missed out on the opportunity, but he didn't like the idea as much as I did. And so we decided that it would not be a good idea for us to become partners because we had different ideas around how we want to run things, which is fair enough. I'm 22 years old. I got no idea, no experience, like just a bunch of ideas. So I can't begrudge him for that. So when that happened, I said, all right, man, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to cut back to part-time here and uh, I'm going to set up a practice in an area which is totally non-competing to you, a good hour away. And um, would you be okay for me to do that for a while while we start navigating a part so I can look after you for the future? So that's exactly what we did. I set it up from there. And my mum is the, the person that found that practice for me. Like she was ringing around looking for rooms to hire. So she found one and then she drove me to the meeting and she's like, all right, I'm going to sit here and wait for you in the car. And if you have trouble negotiating it, come grab me. And so I went up there and got this deal done and got a lease on this property um, for my first practice. And it came down and a bit of a high five with mum, came home, told dad, and I'm into the business world. So then six months after that, I was out of the other practice because I'd grown mine very quickly, was very passionate about it. And then that's how the journey began. And I was all in from that point, you know, making all the mistakes that, are, that I share inside my book and all the mistakes I'm sure that you see with businesses only all day, every day. I've, I've made a lot of them, still making them, just trying to make less expensive ones now. But, um, so that's what happened, my first clinic. And I just grew up from there. And over a three-year period, uh, it grew very rapidly. And um, I hit this point where um, we're doing really well, but it was very dependent on me. And so I became more focused on systemization, forward growth momentum without it being dependent on personalities or particular key, key people of influence and key man. So I started systemizing it to get myself out of there. And when I was doing that, that's when people started asking me more about the coaching side because I, I got headhunted by this firm and so on. So that's kind of how I got from working for someone to working for myself and then growing that. So I heard uh, in your conversation there that you learned uh, from your mistakes. And I would always characterize those more as learning experiences and mistakes because I don't make any mistakes anymore. But that, that leads me to, uh, to believe that that was the impetus behind the book that you wrote. So tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write the book and it sounds like there might be a little bit of lessons learned in that book. So tell me a little bit more. Yeah, there's a lot of lessons learned in there, a lot of insight from personal experience and also what my clients have experienced. So if we fast forward to today, we've had 2,500 clients across the globe inside healthcare that we've, that we've worked with. And um, the drive for the book really was, I was chatting with a friend one day and he's an author. And he said, um, the, the way that you're talking about your business is um, 
this could be applied to any business in the world, not just healthcare. And it'd be really powerful if you could share that because you don't want to, for me, it was like, well, how do we separate our brand from other people? And how do we actually, at the same time, how do we help more people um, that we potentially won't work with as clients? Like how do we create a greater impact? And, uh, and uh, it came to me that a book would be a great way to do that because anyone can buy a book and they can share from the information without having to become a high-end coaching client. So the real drive for it was like, how do we actually help more people without having to service them at the highest level and share this message because I think it's powerful. So that's what drove that. And um, and I hooked up with a buddy who um, gave me some tips on how to write it and then uh, the journey began or I knuckled down and started unpacking all the intellectual property and putting it in there. And it was a really fun but difficult process to write it, but um, I'm really proud that it's out there and we get a lot of great feedback on it. So I um, hope, it's, I hope it's well received. I'm sure it is. Um, so it sounds like there might have been a couple of bumps and bruises along the way. What would you characterize as your biggest adversity uh, that you've had to overcome to get to where you are today? So I think making the decision, first of all, I think was the hardest part for me, like the actual decision that I'm going to have this really difficult conversation, like way back when I was 22, to tell this mentor of mine that, hey, I really like the opportunity to work with you and become a partner, but I'm going to go my own way and I really don't know what I'm doing. So making that decision, that was incredibly hard. That was a really big barrier. And without that, nothing would have happened. The next barrier really um, is going through all the dramas and all the challenges and experiencing all the lessons of removing myself from a business whilst having it still grow at the same time. That was the most challenging part. Partnership disagreements. So when I was at the um, the other coaching company, leaving there, I was also offered a buy-in agreement for that coaching company and saying, no, I'm going to turn my back on all this reliable, easy income to do my own coaching company. Like That was a huge mental challenge. Mm-hmm. I sat with that for about six months. So the challenge is really, like for me, have been like the, the mental battle of making the decision to back myself to take the next step. And the way I've alleviated that every single step of the way is by surrounding myself with good advisors, saying, here's where I'm at, what's next, how can we talk about it, and just getting good advice. So that's how I've tackled it. But the hardest parts have been, I'm stuck, I don't know what to do, where do I go? That, that mental conversation in my own head. And obviously, lots of other things I've experienced from that point, you know, staff leaving, I'm leaving as high and dry. Um, disagreements with with um, business partners or ventures and so on. Just all those sorts of things that happen in business, which are, as you said, um, really great learning opportunities, but things that are not pleasant in the moment. So it sounds like that uh, in your coaching, and you do primarily do this with uh, healthcare professionals, healthcare clinicians, if you will. Uh, what is, there, is there a common theme that you see among these clinicians that are trying to become business owners? There's got to be a transition to be made like you did. So what is kind of the common the common things that they encounter that they seem to have a tough time moving away from in order for them to be more successful in what they do? How would you describe yeah. that if you can? Well, if we look at it, like if I pull it all together, I'd say like the common thread is, and the challenge is shifting identity from that of a practitioner, you know, a clinician into that of a business owner. And then understanding like if they're at this point in time now and they want to be a business owner over here, like what skill sets do they need at the other end of that spectrum? And then how do we actually map out a plan to do that? And then how do, what sort of, how do we prepare them for the level of thinking that they need to have at that level? How do we prepare them for the challenges that are going to come their way so we can overcome them so they don't relapse back into that easy, comfortable practitioner and way of living, the easy clinician lifestyle? And as you would know, it's, it's very easy to stay stuck if we um, make excuses for not moving forward. So we, the number one theme is really getting them prepared for it. If you want these goals, here's what you need to look like. Here's who you need to become. And then showing them that journey and then supporting them the entire way. So I could go into like tactics and, and so on, but ultimately what, what our clients need when they're an owner is to know how to market so they can attract leads how to sell, have a sales system so they can make revenue and profit and produce a high level um, of outcome for their clientele and how to structure a company to lead and manage so it can grow without them. And at the same time, you know, they need to actually start behaving like, uh, like a rural business owner. So there's, they're the common threads that we go through and people get stuck at different points, of course, because we're all different and we identify where they're stuck. And you know, I really like how Mike Michalowicz says this, like, fix this next. Like, what's what's the next problem? And so we really help them by looking at, look, where are you at right now? 
Where do you want to be? What's the next step? Let's just focus on that next step right now that's going to move the, the biggest dominoes for you. Absolutely. So is there an ideal type of uh, practitioner or client for you? Is it, you know, a small solopreneur? Is it a couple, three practitioners? Uh, is it a massive hospital that encompasses a major metropolitan environment? What's the best, I guess, huge range for you? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge range, right? Like we, we work with all of those areas because we identify what is the specific problem to that person. Then we provide them with a very specific solution. So like I, I equally enjoy working with all of them and we get an equal impact with all of them. If I was to say like, sometimes I look at a, a deal and I'm like, that's a total layup. So if I look at someone and um, they've got maybe three practitioners that work for them, a team of say 10 to 15 in total, and they're doing a half a million dollars a year to a million dollars a year. And the symptoms are that it's too dependent on the owner. Um, I look at that and I'm like, that's a layup. Um, I can help that person double that in 12 months and change their life very, very easily by making a few tweaks and uh, very enjoyably from their perspective. Like all the elements just align at that point for really rapid results. Whereas at other, other ends of the spectrum, like a huge company, there's more organizational structure to look at, as you know. And that can be a challenge because you're dealing with so many personalities on the lower end of the spectrum. If they're smaller, we can definitely help those people too, but it's slower for them too. They may not have the capital to expect to spend on advertising and so on, or they may not have the time available to go out and do the free or low cost marketing that we suggest. So it's just a bit of a slower burn. They all work, but yeah, I love the people at 500 to a million a year, three to four practitioners, 10 to 15 staff, like they're, um, Yeah, it's like a real kick to watch them grow so quick and have so much fun. Good for you. Good for you. So there's a reference to a system called Market Rebook and Manage, and that's a system that I think you've coined. Uh, So tell us a little bit about that and how that all works. Perfect. Happy to do so. So it's like three frameworks, really, and the frameworks are, like you said, Market Rebook and Manage. And underneath each framework, there's a series of strategies three main strategies underneath each one. And then underneath each strategy sits you know, dozens more tactics. So when I think about when I was a practitioner, if someone would come in and they'd see me and they were, um, they were injured, uh, I would have a clinical reasoning approach to identify what's going on, where they want to go and what they need. And we do the same thing with the healthcare business. And we put it through the lens of, of our assessment tools. And then we look at, all right, what do you most need right now? Market a rebook or manage or a combination of both and which of the frameworks underneath that do you need? So we use a clinical reasoning approach to make it highly strategic to help our clients to grow. Um, in terms of how that works, so I deliver all the intellectual property. I give all the strategies. It's all done for you. And then our coaching staff help our clients by the hand to implement that model so that our clients can get leads on demand. Uh, they can rebook them appropriately regardless of who's seeing the client or the customer or the patient. And so they can grow a company without it depending on them. So it really is like a clinical reasoning process. And that's exactly like what I've detailed in the book um, from a 30,000 foot view. And if people want to learn more about it, then that's what we do with our coaching program, giving them like really specific stuff. So it sounds a little bit like the, you take a look at a, a particular uh, practitioner's office and you kind of take it in pieces and make sure they get successes and get that success behind them and then move on. So it sort of builds over time. Am I right about that? That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and the time frame is pretty quick. Like we, um, we, we always interview our clients to make sure the people we work with, we can bring about a huge result inside 60 to 90 days. Well, look, we are, we're realists. We know we can help double a company inside 12 months. We mm-hmm. also understand the importance of our cash flow. And we want people to be profitable very quickly. So we've got a few secret levers that we pull to help our clients make some more money real fast. And um, that way they're, um, they're, they're, they're off and running pretty quick. So tell us a little bit about how you can uh, ramp up their marketing to be more successful. Many business owners, I find, myself at times included, have that problem of getting the messaging to get to the level to be more successful. Are there any couple, two, three things that are simple that we can follow to make that move forward? Of course. I mean, obviously it starts with uh, assessing your marketing first, like what's working, what's not. So, I mean, if I was to look at, say, your marketing, and I have not done so, but if I looked at your marketing, I'd literally say that what's working, what's not, show me what's working, and then I'd tweak that and see if I can optimize it further. And that's how we get quick wins. But ultimately with marketing, it comes it comes back to what you said before, Steve, like uh, the message, like what are you actually saying 
to your audience and are you speaking their language where they want to actually hear from you in terms of what you're saying or outcomes, problems, but also are you saying it in a a way that's relatable and are you saying it um, in a way where they want to be near you and around you? Like are you presenting this in 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 a methodology where they want to be around your attractive character? So we do a lot of work on the messaging, like what to say, how to say it, and how often as well. So we look at the, the messaging. We then look at the actual rhythm. Like so if, you, if your message is out there, but it's not resonating, what I notice is people run marketing, but that it doesn't work. They're not getting leads. So if you're running marketing and it's not working, chances are it's your message, firstly. Yeah. The second thing we look at is rhythm. Because if you're running your marketing and it's working, but it's stop and start, then it's like rhythm. Are we communicating at the right rhythm? You know, are we doing the right level of content versus campaign and so on? Let's really dial down into that. And then finally, we look at the platform. Because if your message is good, your rhythm is good, and people aren't responding, well, you can be the world's best kept secret if your, if your message is amazing and no one sees it. So we need to make sure we're getting that message in front of the right audience. Like we need to be fishing in the right pond. You know, if you get a fishing pole and you've got the right bait, but you're dropping your line into like um, poisoned water, no, fish aren't going to bite. So we, we really dial that all down so that, our, so that our clients can very easily get their message out at the right frequency in the right area where their where their future patients are like, yeah, I really want to be involved with you guys and I really want to connect. So a quick question related to getting the messaging out. And uh, I don't know what the answer is. Maybe you uh, know this better than I do. So would you say that uh, social media posts versus videos versus blogging versus posting articles, what would you say would be the more effective way to to market and get that message out? Or is it more dependent on content than method? And- it's definitely, yeah, it's more dependent on content where you're going to, where, you, where you're going to be populating, like which platform for sure. But um, ultimately like where we find it's highly effective, like the best platforms to use for our, for our clients are firstly getting a message out via text message because we can go directly to their past audience um, email because that's your asset. Like we can go straight out to your asset and then once we want to go and find new customers, it's going to depend on the actual client we're working with and where their customers are hiding. But we do typically recommend Facebook and Instagram in the healthcare space. And when we're looking at those platforms such as Instagram or Facebook, um, we have a series, we call it the omnipresence method so that we can actually put out there, the, the we, need to, we can turn a blog into video content. We can turn that into social media posts and whatnot. And we can repurpose the whole lot and we turn one piece into eight pieces. So we recommend all of them because the overall effect we want to have is that your customer is going to say, oh, wow, I see you really love what you do. I get the feeling that you love what you do because I see you everywhere all the time. And that's part of the art to it. So it's not one over the other. It's all of them. But I personally start with writing an article and then we turn that into video content. One big video, we chop that up into seven or eight little videos we then turn that into social media cue cards and so on. We turn that into sound bites. So we repopulate it all over the board so that that one message can be shared. And uh, the, the beautiful part about that, Steve, is you only do the work once and uh, good. it makes That's it look like you're everywhere, which you are good. everywhere, really. So we're in a COVID-19 environment. Uh, at the time of this uh, podcast, we're just on the verge of vaccinations getting introduced and uh, being delivered. Is there anything that has changed in your mind? Let's one, two or three big items that has impacted the healthcare. And what do you recommend as to any changes or redirects that are needed given where we are today? Yeah, there's, there's a lot. Well, what a different world we're living in. So I can tell you that the dangers in COVID are obviously like a shutdown. If you're going to shut down, it's very difficult to create revenue. So first and foremost, what I've been focusing on with my members is creating alternate um, avenues to create revenue when that opportunity is available inside of healthcare. Like a lot of our clients, we've helped them to produce a lot of video content and so on. So they can sell that as courses or to do a lot of online um, treatments and so on. A lot of our clients are running um, like uh, exercise classes, Pilates classes and so on. Some are running digital consulting. So we've taught them how to do that. Like that's really important. You need to generate cash flow. Um, the next thing that we focused on heavily is how do we actually market so that we can bring people into that digital revenue source in, during COVID-19 so that they're actually still growing during this time. Um, and it, we're really proud to say that our clients have worked so hard during this by applying our information. And a lot of them have grown tremendously. 
um, in spite of what's going on, which I know is unusual in this environment, but we're very proud of them and really happy that it's working. But the another thing I've really focused on with them is when you are in shutdown, your customers still need you. So I show them a communication rhythm so they can communicate with their database and communicate on social media. We teach them what to say, when to say it, how to say it, so that their customers are going to come back when they reopen. Um, we've also introduced rebooking processes so that when you go into shutdown, that doesn't mean anything. Like we're still going to be booking in clientele for after the shutdown. Um, we've shown them how to generate cash flow in advance of providing the services um, at discounted level so that when they come back out and they open up, they've already made the money for the next month. So they don't have to worry about being down during um, during periods of lacking cash flow. Yeah, so, sounds, sounds like great advice. One last question before I give you a couple of open-ended ones. Um, please. What is the biggest takeaway that you would say, or what do you want readers to take away from your book, The Practice Acceleration Method? So There's probably a one, lot, but what's a key one that you want them to yeah, read? The number one thing I'd like readers to take away from the book is that anyone can grow a business when they have the right process. It's not about um, natural ability or you're a business person or you're not or you're an introvert, extrovert. It simply comes down to having a process to follow. And the very nature of the fact that people reading it are already in healthcare, they are already bright people that know how to learn processes. They're very smart. And this is just giving them that the smartest process to follow in the easiest possible way. And that's the takeaway I'd like them, for them to do it. That seems like uh, it would resonate with a lot of business owners. So what, what is it, uh, we're, we're nearing the end of our time allotment here. So what is it that we haven't talked about that you want the audience to know about, Tristan? Oh, wow. That's a good one, isn't it? Here's like a big takeaway I'd like to share this from personal experience. Like when I started focusing on growing my business and pulling myself back from healthcare, that was a real mental roadblock for me. And I know that's shared by a lot of people that I speak with. And what I learned was that by pulling myself back from clinical and focusing on the business, I could actually help a lot more patients. And um, I had this like negative conversation loop in my mind that I should not focus on my business. I should be there serving my patients instead. But um, I overcame that by understanding I can help a lot more people by growing my business. And um, that's something I really like for our members and uh, our listeners here to understand is that by growing a business, it is actually enabling them to help more people. And that is how they can become the best practitioner is by serving more people and creating a business to employ more fantastic people and lead them. The, um, the other thing I always say to my team is leadership is one of the few commodities people cannot take away from you. Um, in a world of like fast-paced tactics and digital media and new apps coming out, the one thing that the world needs right now more than ever is leadership. And the way to create leadership is to actually learn business. There is simply no better personal growth tool than owning a business. And that is how you're going to future proof yourself and help the people in your organization. So that's a little bit about how I think um, more about me. Like this is what I do for, uh, not just for a living, but this is what I love. So I think it's one thing I want to share with people is that uh, I'm not a workaholic by any stretch of the imagination. I work maybe two hours a day by choice, but this is running through my head 24 hours a day because it's my absolute passion and it's okay to love what you're passionate about. And uh, you, this whole concept of balance, I think, is something you need to um, reach your own conclusion on what makes you really fired up in life. Because if I didn't have this to think about all day, I'd find something else to be super passionate about and uh, I'm really obsessive about because it just really gets me going. Well, sounds great, Tristan. Thanks so much for sharing that. Before we go, how can someone get a hold of you? Where would you like them to go to get further information about you, your business, your book? Where do they go? Great. So if anyone would like to learn more about us and connect with us, I'd certainly love the opportunity. The best place to go is the practiceaccelerationmethod.com. That takes you straight to the book where it's a free plus shipping. And then practiceacceleration.com is our URL just for our plain website. So they're the probably two best. I'm very active across social media. If someone pings me on Facebook, we're pretty good at picking up on that as well. And we love meeting new people. And it will always point them in the right direction with a free resource and uh, we welcome new friendships. So if anyone is thinking about doing that, please do so. And we'll welcome you with open arms and help you out. That'll be great, Tristan. Thanks so much. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been my pleasure. 